Monday night class on uh, psychological issues. And uh, like every Monday night, I'll try to connect it with the Parsha. But this, this week, it's too easy. <clears throat> and actually, the problem is that there's so many things in this Parsha that are psychological in nature that it's hard to focus in on just on one thing. And all day long, I was debating between two completely different classes. And um, I'm still debating. I haven't finished debating. <laughs> I haven't decided yet. Um, but I guess the topic that we'll talk about is what I wrote on Facebook. And on Facebook, I called the class Evil Before God. And um, to understand this title, We're going to need to, to look again at, uh, at the story of, uh, of what this Parsha tells us about, all the different um, services that the high priest would do on Yom Kippur in the temple. Sorry about that. And one might say that the highlight of all the service that was done, there were two highlights. One was, one couldn't be seen, at least not directly, it was seen indirectly, which was the high priest entering the Holy of Holies and bringing the, uh, bringing the incense there and praying there. But there was another highlight or, or sort of like, one might say that in terms of in terms of the process that people went through when they viewed the uh, service in the temple on Yom Kippur, the highlight was really the moment of uh, of casting a <clears throat> a ballot, as it were, between two goats that were had to be identical, they had to be of the same age, the same stature, had the same coloring, and so on. And just by, just by um, chance, as it were, one goat became a sacrifice that was sacrificed in the temple, and the other became the scapegoat, the one that was taken out into the desert. And there, seemingly, it was killed. But this moment of having to decide this chance event um, is very powerful. It was very powerful also in the sense of the lesson that it tried to teach through the service. Um, this is one of the things that's hard for us modern people to imagine. But in a, in in, in a certain way, what people saw in the temple was actually sort of like a play. It had meaning, it had a climax, it had a resolution, and it had, if you want, a type of happy end. I don't know how to call it exactly, although it didn't always have to end happily. But the temple service beyond being serving God is, is actually a, a, like a lab in which the psyche, the, the, our psychology and everything that we are was sort of put on display and then worked with. And then it went through a process. It went through something that happened to it. So this notion of there being two identical goats that now one is going to become a sacrifice to God and the other one is going to become a sacrifice as it were and not clearly how this is going to happen outside the temple to who is it being sacrificed why is it being killed this has a very strong uh, parallel in the psyche. And 
to decipher the images, we have to understand what, what they mean, and to understand the whole play that's going on here. So we have to, first of all, understand the images and what they represent. So before we continue, I just gave a short introduction. I'd like to read the verses themselves to remind everybody of what actually happened. And then we're going to look at the Ibn Ezra, Rabbi Avram Ibn Ezra, who's one of the early commentaries on the Chumash. Then we'll look at the Ramban, Nachmanides. And from there, we'll turn to something that the Baal Shem Tov taught about this. And we'll try to understand and decipher this whole picture that's going on in the temple and understand what kind of, how it affects our psyche, how it affected the psyche of the people that were alive at the time who saw it and how we can gain from it by learning from it today. Okay, so I'm gonna share the screen. And this is what I want, hopefully. Okay. So I'm gonna read a few verses just so that we get into the, uh, into the topic. This is from the second verse of the Parsha. God said to Moses, tell your brother Aaron that he is not to come at will into the shrine, meaning into the Holy of Holies behind the curtain, in front of the cover that is upon the ark, right inside the Holy of Holies was the ark and on top of it was the cover. And cover actually sounds even in English the same as the word in Hebrew, kaporet. And that is upon the ark lest he die, for I appear in the cloud over the cover, for I shall appear in the cloud over the cover. Thus, only, only thus, meaning only in this way shall Aaron enter the shrine, the Holy of Holies, with a bull of the herd for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering, and he has to bring these, these uh, offerings, these sacrifices. And he shall be dressed in a sacral linen tunic with linen breeches next to his flesh, meaning these are not the usual eight golden garments worn by the high priest, but rather simple white garments made out of linen and be girt with a linen sash and he shall wear a linen turban. They are sacral vestments. He shall bathe his, water in, his body in water and then put them on. All this is a description of what needs to happen on Yom Kippur. And from the Israelite community he shall take two he goats for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. So this is the first time we, we uh, encounter these two goats that we're gonna be talking about. Aaron is to offer his own bull of sin offering to make a spiation for himself and for his household. And now, Aaron, this is the highlight. Aaron shall take the two he goats and let them stand before God, standing before God at the entrance of the tent of meeting, meaning at the entrance of the tabernacle, of the inner part of the tabernacle. And he shall place lots upon the two goats, one marked for God and the other marked for Azazel. So these were like two uh, wooden uh, uh, plates and one it said for God and the other one it said for Azazel. And they were put into a, uh, mixed up in some uh, little box. And someone would take these two out and would put one over each of the goats, one of these over each of the goats, and then he would show them. And so there would be on one goat would be for God, it would become a sacrifice, a sin offering. And the other one would say, for Azazel, and it would be taken out into the wilderness, into the desert. Aaron shall bring forward the goat designated by Lot for God, which he is to offer as a sin offering. While the goat designated by Lot for Azazel shall be left standing alive before God to make expiation with it 
and descend it off to the wilderness for Azazel. So we'll see here that there's a very important um, point that even though this goat is sent off into the wilderness to Azazel, and we still have to know what that is, we don't know what that is yet. Before that, as the other goat, its twin, is being offered as a sin offering, meaning it's being slaughtered and then the blood of every sin offering of this type has to be um, squirted on the, or inside the holy, inside the sanctuary. All this time, the second goat, which was designated by Lot to go to Azazel, stands in front of the sanctuary. It has to stand there. And then Aaron does a few other things. And then he has, during this time, he brings the incense into the Holy of Holies. I'm not going to read all this. He shall then slaughter the people's goat of sin offering, bringing its blood behind the curtain and do with its blood as he has done with the blood of the bull. He shall sprinkle it over the cover and in front of the cover. So the one that was slaughtered for God, the blood, as we said, has to be brought into the Holy of Holies. And it's this sin offering, this goat, that is what atones, as it were. That's what causes the atonement. And it says when he goes into the make expiation, expiation in the Holy of Holies, nobody else shall be there in the tent of meeting until he comes out. When he has made expiation for himself and his household and for the whole congregation of Israel. And he does all that. Then, remember, there's still this goat on the outside. So the goat that's on the outside, which is going to go in a moment to the wilderness, He's been in front, alive, in front of the in front of the sanctuary this whole time. Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities and transgressions of the Israelites, whatever their sins, putting them on the head of the goat, and it shall be sent off to the wilderness through a designated man somebody who was designated to take the goat to the wilderness. Thus the goat shall carry on it all their iniquities to an inaccessible region, and the goat shall be set free in, in the wilderness. So set free really means that it was pushed off a cliff. And then Aaron comes back into the Holy of Holies and he takes out um, the uh, the uh, the incense that he had left there, and that's basically the end of the service. There's a few more things he needs to do, and that's the end of the service. So really, this was the climax and the highlight, the lot that was put between one goat going for God and the other one going to Azazel. So what is this Azazel? What, what exactly are we talking about? So let's see what the Ibn Ezra says. He said, I, mean, I don't have an English translation, unfortunately, so I'm just going to have to translate it quickly uh, in Hebrew, uh, into English. So he says like this. This lot thing, Guralot means lot. It's known from the tradition of our forefathers. Says the Gon, one of the sages in the hundreds of years, few hundred years before the Ibn Ezra, he lived in, in 1200 about. That Azazel is the name of a place. And it's called that because it's a very harsh, difficult land. And as in Hebrew means bold and hard. So it's a, it's a very difficult place. 
And God commanded to take the goat there. And a goat in Hebrew here is called a sa'il. Sa'il means that it is hairy. It has a lot of hair. The goat after age three or between age two and three in its third year becomes very hairy, very long hair. And to sacrifice it there. So it's a very strange thing. It's not exactly sacrifice. It's thrown off the cliff. It's not sacrificed in the regular way. And at the end of our Parsha, we learned that if you designate something as a sacrifice for God, you have to slaughter it inside the temple grounds. You can't slaughter it anywhere else. So how does this actually work? So he says, it's very similar to what we read in, last, in this Shabbos with the leper, that the way that he becomes purified after he's healed from the spiritual sickness is he has to bring two birds, and one of the birds is slaughtered, and the other bird is, is let free on the field, in a place where it's a wilderness where there's nobody living there. Okay, so all this is very good. The question still is, why is it not slaughtered? Why is this goat not slaughtered like every other sacrifice? Why is it thrown off the cliff? So he says here, he goes back and he says, no, no, no. It's a type of sacrifice, but it's not the usual thing. And then the Ibn Ezra ends with something of a riddle. He says, if you could understand the secrets that lies behind the word Azazel, you would know the secret of this goat and the secret of its name. For it has other exemplars in the Torah. And I will tell you some of its secrets when you're 33. This is what the, what the uh, Ibn Ezra says. What do you mean when, it, when you're 33? So it's well known that Nachmanides, who was a little bit after uh, the Ibn Ezra, he didn't like the Ibn Ezra's riddles. So he decided to reveal them all. <laughs> and, and he sort of ruined his, uh, his, his, his thing. But you have to understand that the Ibn Ezra was not concealing it because he wanted to play tricks or games. He was concealing it because this was considered to be a very difficult topic. It was a topic that if you're not ready for it, you shouldn't be learning it. So you need to be ready. So the Ibn Ezra counted on the fact that if somebody was wise enough to understand his riddle and solve it, he was probably ready to understand the topic that's hiding behind the story of the goat that's sent out to the wilderness. So let's see what, the, what Nachmanides writes. He says like this. He quotes the Ibn Ezra, and he says, he quotes this part at the end, when you're 33, you'll know. And he right away says, what, what, what does the Ibn Ezra mean? He means after 33 verses. You don't have to be 33 years old. You have to count 33 verses from this verse, from the verse in which Ibn Ezra wrote this, which was Leviticus 17, 7, 16, 8. And you count 33 verses. You come to another verse in our Parsha. And that verse talks about the fact that you're not allowed to slaughter an animal as a sacrifice outside the temple. Why? Because if you do it that way, then it's like you're serving a, 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 another God. Like you're saying that there's somebody else. Who is this other God? So says Nachmanides like this. The Ibn Ezra, he was careful to conceal. And I am a blabbermouth. And I'm going to tell you the secret. Why am I going to tell you the secret? Because his, it says Nachmanides, what's, it, what's the big difference between Nachmanides and the Ibn Ezra? The Nachmanides is a master of the Torah's concealed tradition, the Sod. 
And the Ibn Ezra was the pshat of the pshat. He was a person who only dealt with the literal, at least in his commentary on the Torah. And when it came to anything that was, call it Kabbalistic in nature, the Ibn Ezra tried to stay away, even though he has uh, some books in which he deals with some more esoteric topics of Torah, but he never really gets into anything that you could call mystic, mystical. But as we'll see now, this whole class is going on into the direction that the mystical is really in the end the psychological. But that's really what we're talking about. So says the Nachmanides. The sages have already revealed this, for instance, in the Madras Bereshit Rabbah, it says there, Venasa Seir Alav Ze'esav, that this he goat will take the sins of the Jewish people out of the wilderness, say the sages in the Madras, that's Esav, Esav, Shneemar, and Esav, Achi, Ish, Ishtair. For it says about Esav that he was a hairy man. So, Understand that Aesop, he's the exemplar of this he goat. He's what this he goat represents. It's a very strange thing to say. E even when the sages said this, what exactly did they mean? So the he goat, what are you trying to say? On the other hand, Jacob was a simple man, a sincere man. And it says that because Jacob is sincere, now quotes Nachmanides from another Medrash, from Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer, and he says that there it says that for this reason, not yet clear what the reason is, but for this reason, on Yom Kippur we would give a bribe to the evil inclination, Samech Mem, as he's called, so that he not get in the way of our other sacrifice, the one that goes before God, that's for God, right? There were two he goes. So one is a bride, and the other one is a real sacrifice. This becomes stranger and stranger from moment to moment, right? This, it, we wanted to uh, decipher what the images mean, but they seem to be getting stranger and stranger. So there's a bribe involved. And all the sins of Israel were put on this bribe, on the scapegoat. And then he says, when all the sins were put on this bribe, then the evil inclination sees that the Jewish people don't have any sins. And then he himself praises the Jewish people. And he says, How, what kind of people did you create? These people, they're, they're like angels. Angels, I know, they don't eat, they don't drink. But the Jewish people, oh, I see that they don't eat and don't drink either. So he's all impressed by what's going on. So what does all this help? So it says the Nachmanides that the reason that the Ibn Ezra connected this to slaughtering outside the temple, then bringing a sacrifice outside the temple, needs to be understood as an act of desperation. Why would somebody bring a sacrifice and not bring it to the temple? Why would he do it outside the temple? So it says Nachmanvis, this is a type of act of desperation. Serving other gods is an act of desperation. What's the desperation? What kind of desperation is there in serving another God? 
So to fully understand this, we're going to have to talk a little bit more about what a sacrifice actually means. When somebody brings a sacrifice to God, he's basically saying, my actions are devoted to the good. We've talked about this in past classes. The problem with that is that maybe when I'm young, or let's say I've been reset, I come out of Yom Kippur, feeling all cleansed and pure, and I say to myself, from now on, everything that I do will be for the good. That's very common. Most people feel that way. And then you start living your life again, and you've got these four days between Yom Kippur and Sukkot, and then you've got Sukkot, so it's, it's an easy time to follow that decision. But then you come into the winter months, and life begins to become normal again. And quickly we find ourselves that we're not really able to hold by that decision. And that there's a lot of negative things creeping up into our lives. Bringing a sacrifice is like saying, I want to reset. I want in the middle of the year to reset. I want to redevote myself only to the good. I want to decide from now on, every single morning, I'm going to wake up at 6 a.m. like I want to, or 5 a.m. or every person when they want to. I'm going to sit and learn my daily learning. I'm going to do what's needed. I'm going to surprise my family and make breakfast for them, whatever it is. And then the next morning comes and I haven't slept enough or it's cold outside or it's hot, or it's hot outside or whatever it is, and things don't work out. So over time, we begin to collect the feeling. It's, it becomes more and more, it becomes heavier from day to day that we're not so good. That though we may understand that it's better to lead a life that's devoted to the good, we're not very capable of doing that. And we begin to give up. It says Nachmanides that at some point, at some point, there's a feeling of desperation, of abandonment, that I have no hope and I'm never going to change. And I'm always going to be in the end, overtaken by the negative inside of me. And so there comes this act of desperation which says, this is really desperation. It's more than just a bad, it's more than just a feeling that I have no hope, that I'm a lost cause. It's, a, it's beyond that already. It's a feeling that at some level, I have to appease the negative. I have to appease the other side in me because otherwise it's never going to leave me alone. The act of sacrificing to a false god comes in a person who doesn't believe in false gods, doesn't worship idols. It comes in as an expression of despair, simply despair. The sacrifice is meant to say, leave me alone. Leave me alone. I'll give you your due, just leave me alone. And what does it mean, I'll give you your due? Well, here, in the terms of the sacrifice, if it's an actual sacrifice, if you actually take the ego, then you sacrifice it out in the field. And you offer it as a sacrifice to whatever's in the field, then that's a sign of giving up and saying, if you can't beat them, join them. If you can't beat them, join them here means that I have not been able to conquer the, the, the evil in me, the negative in me, the evil in the world, 
the negative in the world. And so I have only one option, which is to serve it. At one level or another. So most people don't serve evil like a caricature. They don't become like the evil clown or somebody who's just a mass murderer or anything like that. Most people don't do that, thank God. But if there are pockets of evil inside of me, pockets of inability to overcome the negative inside of me, so a sacrifice would mean I gave up on it. I've given up. I've given in. And it's like saying, this is just how who I am and what I am. And I have to deal with it. I have to admit it to myself. I have to admit to myself that in the end, there's a powerful force in me that I cannot control. And I have to abandon, abandon myself to it. That's what's called a sacrifice in the field. And the reason that this is called a sacrifice to Azazel is because Azazel, there's all kinds of explanations. All of them pretty much go to the same direction. They, Azazel represents despair, a state of despair. Why Asav? How did Asav get into this? Asav was the first person to express utter despair from life. If you have heard any of my classes in the past 10 years, I talk about this a lot. When, he, when Asav is 15 years old and he's being chased by whomever he's being chased and he comes to Jacob and he says to Jacob, quick, feed me this red, red stuff that you've made. And Jacob says, I'll feed it to you, but sell me your firstborn rights. What are the firstborn rights? Very interesting. What are the firstborn rights? So somebody would say the firstborn rights are that the firstborn gets twice as much of an inheritance as the children that were born after him. But that's not the argument that Jacob made. Jacob wanted the firstborn rights, the ability to sacrifice the family sacrifice, meaning to lead the spiritual service of the family. That's what the firstborn was meant to do in each family. The firstborn had the right to sacrifice. And the right to sacrifice means, if we talk about this psychologically, to sit on the, on the chair and to psychoanalyze everybody else. That's really what it means. It means to lead people spiritually. It means to lead them psychologically. And he convinced Esau by telling him, we're going to come to a moment to Esau of despair. I'm just giving you the background. He convinced him by telling him it's a very dangerous business to be the one with the firstborn rights because if you slaughter incorrectly, you're, you've taken... You've shed blood for no reason, and you're susceptible to being punished by heaven. So why do you need this, Asa? The same problem that every therapist has. If you slaughter the other person's animal soul the wrong way, and you hurt them during the therapy instead of causing good, then you're susceptible to be punished by heaven. Who told you to? It's like every doctor. Do no harm in this. Asaph agrees, but he doesn't just agree because of Jacob's argument. Jacob, Asaph says, Esau says, I'll sell my firstborn rights to you, for I am going to die, and what do I have to do with firstborn rights? What benefit can they give me? Now, the literal meaning is that Asa was so out of breath that he was about to die. But we know that that's not the case. He's a 15-year-old, very strong, very wild young man. He wasn't going to die. Asa was not talking about his imminent death. 
he was talking about the end, the demise of every individual. For Esau, that was a cause of despair. I'm going to die. So what in the world or how in the world could I benefit from these firstborn rights? What good would it do me anyway? It doesn't mean I'm going to die. I've despaired of life. Who despairs of life? God is life. The goodness is life. So a person who's despaired of goodness, who's despaired of godliness, he's the person who feels that he's going to die. And that's what Esau felt. So Esau is like this person who sacrifices in the field. He's given up. And he said, I have no hope. I'm going to die. I cannot join the living. I cannot join the goodness. I am what I am. I admit it. And therefore, my only course of action is to abandon my hope in the good. Nothing good will ever come out of me. And that's it. So take the firstborn rights. I'm going to die anyway. Asa was the first person to express exactly this sentiment of sacrificing outside the temple. Again, a sacrifice inside the temple is like a reset, like a recommitment to the good. A sacrifice outside the temple is like giving in to the negative inside of me and saying, I just have to accept it. So what does Nachmanides mean here? When he says that we give a bribe to the evil in the field. We have to bribe the evil. What does that mean? What do you mean bribe the evil? You can't bribe it. Is it going to leave you alone because you bribed it? So I don't know how Nachmanides' words were understood. He wrote them about 800 years ago. I don't know how they were understood for, for six centuries, five centuries. I mean, I'm sure people understood this. But until you come to the Baal Shem Tov, I, 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 I don't know of a coherent explanation, at least coherent to our times, the way the modern person thinks that really explains what he means by you bribe the evil inclination by sending the goat out, but not slaughtering it. To understand this, we have to look at one more source before we look at the Baal Shem Tov himself. And, the, and this source, I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna quote. I'm gonna stop sharing the screen also. Um, this, this uh, I'm just going to quote. What Nachmanides wrote is that, and the Ibn Ezra, they both quoted the Talmud in the Babylonian Talmud that describes what happens to the goat. So what happens to the goat? It's thrown off a cliff, so it dies. It, it, it's, it's, you know, it, even a goat can't survive something like that, so it dies. In the Jerusalem Talmud, which to a certain extent, the Jerusalem Talmud is is more, if I would have to say, uh, more realistic in a certain sense. It doesn't talk so much in, in simile, it doesn't talk so much in parables. It's, it's more realistic, more literal. So the Jerusalem Talmud says something a little bit different. It says that the goat was pushed off a cliff, but the cliff wasn't exactly a cliff. It was more like a, a steep decline. And being that it's a goat, Sometimes it was able to survive. In fact, it says that all the years of Shimon Atzadik, who was a Kohen Gadol, he was a high priest in the time of the Second Temple, that his, he was 70 years a high priest. During those 70 years, every single time that they pushed the goat off the cliff, it died. But after Shimon Atzadik passed away and there were high priests that were not as good as he was, not as righteous as he was. So sometimes, pretty much half and half, the goat would run off into the wilderness. It, it survived the fall easily. It got up, shook itself, 
and then ran off into the wilderness, and then would be eaten by the um, by the uh, 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 people traveling the wilderness who would find it and 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 use it for food. Why is this important? Because if the goat represents the evil in us then not slaughtering it, meaning not sacrificing it to the evil, to the evil forces as it were, not seeing the evil as inevitable and therefore sacrificing to it, means that we acknowledge that there's evil inside of us, but we don't have to kill it. It doesn't have to be killed. The acknowledgement is like this. This is where the fine line is. And it's a very fine line because everything in the, in the psyche is very delicate. There's the one option, which is I completely succumb to my evil and say, I need to sacrifice, meaning I offer it. I'm giving myself, I'm giving from myself to the source of evil. That's the one option. The other option is what was done in this temple service, which is to come and say, I acknowledge the fact that I've done wrong. And I offer you the wrong in me, the evil in me, a bribe. Why a bribe? Because I acknowledge the fact that I cannot yet completely get rid of you. That's what I acknowledge. Not that you've won. Not that I am hopelessly negative. Not that I am without repair, that I'm a lost cause. But that for now, all I can do is admit that yes, I've done wrong, but I'm not sacrificing to you. I'm not saying this is a road with no return. This is not a one-way street. For now, I have to admit the fact that yes, I have some negative things in me, maybe a lot of negative in me. The scapegoat is big enough to put all the sins of all the people, all the Jews, everybody on it. There's a lot of uh, evil there. There's a lot of negativity there but it's not sacrificed. It's just thrown out into the wilderness. So here's yours. This is called a bribe. Now to understand this fully, I said, like I said, it was very hard, I think, to understand this until the Baal Shemdoth came and explained it. So the Baal Shemdoth said like this, there's a verse in Tehillim in chapter 119, that says, Chishavti drachai, Vashiva raglai eledotecha. Says, I've calculated my ways, and sorry. Says the Baal Shem Tov, I know, what, what does this verse mean? It means I've calculated my ways and I return my feet to your commandments. It's a very uh, strange verse, not exactly clear. What is he saying, says the Baal Shem Tov? What is David saying there? David is saying, that a person has to calculate their path. You can't live your life assuming that you're just good. You can't do that, that's naive. You have to know that there is something inside of you that will always demand its portion. What is this something inside of you? That's the negative part. And the negative part is not willing to let you do good until you give it something. 
So it says the Baal Shem Tov, and this is the way that Rav Ginsburg usually explains it. The beginning of the verse is, I left out the beginning of the verse a little bit on purpose, but also because it's what changes everything. The, the, sorry, it's the verse before it. It says, in the middle of the night, I wake up in order to praise you. So the Baal Shem Tov puts these two verses together and he says like this, that in order for a person to be able to wake up when they want to, in this case, in the middle of the night to say tikkun chatzot or whatever they want to do, meaning they want to stop giving the body its needed sleep. They want to stop giving their cravings what they want. Says the Baal Shem Tov, you can't just do it by waking up in the middle of the night, it won't work. You have to calculate your ways. You have to take into consideration the fact that you have a negative inclination. And the negative inclination is not going to let you do what you want to do. Again, this is just an example. Every person has their middle of the night that they want to wake up at, right? Which might be any other good thing that they want to do. And the evil inclination will stop them. One option would be to just give up, sacrifice the evil inclination and say, the sacrifice would be like saying, the middle of the night belongs to you, it doesn't belong to me. That's what it would mean to bring a sacrifice in the field in this case. I've been trying to wake up at five o'clock in the morning to, to learn for the last 10 years, I've never succeeded. And so I now pronounce officially that five o'clock in the morning does not belong to me. I just can't do it. That's a sacrifice in the field. Instead, says the Baal Shem Tov, you have to acknowledge, meaning not to give in to the evil, which is really not to want to change. It's really just to give up. You have to acknowledge that it's powerful and you have to give it its, its part. So what do you do, says the Baal Shem Tov, to get up in the middle of the night? That's his example. I guess that's maybe something that he coped with or somebody that came to him coped with. He says, you can't wake up in order to go and pray or to learn. You have to wake up to go drink coffee. You have to wake up to go eat some pudding. You have to wake up for something that the body wants something that you have a physical craving for, that you have physical needs involved in. That's called a bribe. The bribe is not something forbidden. I can't give something that I don't, that's not permitted, but I can give you something that you want. You want the seagull, don't you? Okay, here, come take it. Sometimes the he-goat would die on the cliff, sometimes it wouldn't. There are two options. I don't know what will come out of this. This coffee that I'm going to drink in the middle of the night, it's going to be very sweet. I'm going to make it extra sweet. I'm going to make it such that it's the best cup of coffee I've ever had. Or if it's pudding or whatever it is, it's going to be the best pudding I've ever had. And I don't know whether in the end this will serve the negative or not. I don't know whether I'm strengthening this, the negative or not. Says the Baal Shem Tov, in fact, it's almost certain that not only am I not strengthening the negative, I'm actually just grazing its needs. I'm not really feeding it. Because what does it want? What does it really want? It wants total capitulation. It doesn't want just, you know, a ego thrown off the cliff. It doesn't want just a cup of coffee. It wants me to keep sleeping. That's what it really wants. But this is the trick here. That when you're dealing with those things that are most difficult, you can't get 100% of what you want in your life. You simply can't. Says so the Baal that's what it means not to be prideful. To be lowly of the lowly nature means to understand that I have to give a bribe. I'm not yet at the level that I can go 
completely against my nature, completely against my negative inclination. So I have to give something. That's what the Nachmanides meant that this second goat, the scapegoat, is a bribe. And he says you have to be willing to give these bribes to the negative inclination in order to do the positive. In those places, you don't have to do it all the time, you only need it in those places where you're stuck, where you feel that you can't get over the opposition. In those places, you have to know how to use this ego, this scapegoat. So what does the temple service of the two goats teach us? The temple service was meant to suggest to us that like the Pasuk, there's a verse that says in Tehillim, there is no person who is righteous and doesn't do any evil. Says the Baal Shem Tov, even in the good that we do, there's some self-interest involved. There's always some negativity involved. Why? Because this is the nature of exile. I'm going to say a few words about this in a moment. It's a very powerful thought that he gives. He says, from the moment that Adam and Eve ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the world is mixed. There is evil in everything. We would think that in the temple we wouldn't give evil even a footrest. We wouldn't bring it in. But the Torah thinks different. And the Torah says that even in the temple, on the holiest day, understand that if you want to conquer the evil, you have to be willing to admit its existence and to deal with it. In order to not give in to it, you have to be willing to admit that it is a real problem. You can't just live in a hunky-dory world. As Rav Steinzel Salah Shalom used to say, if you wake up in the morning and the birds are chirping and everything's beautiful, then one of two things happen. Either Mashiach has come or you passed away in your sleep. Because the world is much more complex than that. You're much more complex than that. Everything is mixed with good and evil. There are considerations to say that things are good and that an act that was done was all good. And there are reasons to say, no, it's what the opposite. It was mixed with evil. It was mixed with self-interest. It was mixed with pride. It was mixed with this, with that, and the other thing. So somebody says here that it's a decoy. That's a great way, that's a great way to describe it. But again, Nachmanides calls it a bribe. So in the temple service, on the holiest day, the climax, the highlight was saying to people, you have to come and accept the fact that you're going to have to be dealing with the negative things in you, in the world, and to some extent, you're going to have to learn how to work with it because you can't assume that you're free of it. In fact, when does a person succumb to the evil? When does a person offer a sacrifice to the evil, giving into it? When they unrealistically assume that they're supposed to be perfectly righteous. When I can't admit my own shortcomings, my own fa fallacies, my own iniquities, that's when I'm most susceptible to the negative. But the more I can come to terms with it, that this is part of who I am, then I can deal with it, as David Amalekh, as King David says, 
in an intellectual, in, in, a, in an awake state, I'll calculate my steps and figure out what is it that I can do in order to ensure that I am left alone to do the good. Now, there's another beautiful um, example of this. It's in the second book of Kings, chapter three, the very end of chapter three, there was there a war with Moab and Moab was losing terribly. And their king says the uh, Medrash, well, the, the, the book of Kings says that he sacrificed his son on the wall of his city and that caused the Jewish people to lose the war. And it's a terrible thing when you think about it. He sacrificed his son, and because he sacrificed his son, which is a terrible thing in and of itself, it caused the Jewish people to lose. How can, how can we understand something like that? So the sages say in the Medrash, what, what happened was like this. He, one option was that he asked his people, what, who are these, who is this nation? What's their, great merit that they're able to vanquish me. And the, his people told him, they are the children of Abraham. Right? Moab is a, are the descendants of Lot, Abraham's nephew. They're the descendants of Abraham. What did Abraham do? He went to sacrifice his son to God. And because of that, of course he didn't. But because of that, they, they are victorious. So he said, I'll do the same thing and I'll actually sacrifice him. So that's one option. The other option in the matter says, no, he said like this, I don't care about their God. I'm just interested in the action. So you're saying that sacrificing a child is a way to win. So I'll do the same thing to my idol. So why did that cause the Jewish people to lose? So the sages say, because they were guilty of many such iniquities themselves. And the moment that he did this, it awakened in the heavens, the reckoning with the Jewish people themselves, that you're also guilty of the same. You've also done the same terrible things. Why do I bring this strange story? Because one of the points that you can get from it is that when somebody is pushed to the wall, he's got his back against the wall and he's about to lose everything, he will sacrifice everything. The same is true of the evil inside of us. That if you think you're going to beat it <clears throat> completely and fully and 100%, you're not going to give it an inch then it will fight back for its dear life and you will lose. That's what that story is saying. Like the king of Moab is like the evil inclination. It will find a way to entrap you. Again, why? Because it comes from your feeling that somehow you're better, that somehow this is not your problem. It is. It's part of you. This is how God set up the world that you have to continue fighting this part of you. And it's coming from you. But, but, and this is the big but, it should all be, we mentioned this in the beginning, that the scapegoat is placed before God the whole time that the other goat is sacrificed and all the work that was done inside the Holy of Holies. You have to feel constantly that you're in front of God. If you don't feel that in the end you're not I'll say it this way. Where does the pride come from? It comes from the fact that you feel that you're left, that, that you are in control. If a person feels that they're in control and somehow they do a sin and somehow they do something wrong, they say the wrong thing to somebody and they hurt somebody and so on and so forth. And they say, how could I have done this? What did I do? And so on and so forth. They can't come out of that. That's exactly succumbing to the evil because you felt that it's you and you, and, and you alone. For this to work, 
you had to see the whole time in the temple, the scapegoat standing in front of God, in front of the Holy of Holies, in front of the sanctuary. You have to feel that you're not here alone. You have to, you have to feel that this is how God built the world for his reason. I don't know why this is the evil I'm dealing with inside of me, but it is what it is. I didn't set up the world. I didn't create it. I didn't set up my life. I didn't give myself my abilities and my lack of abilities. I'm asked to do work from these circumstances. So I have to accept them that these circumstances were given by God. I have to feel that I'm standing in front of God. If I feel that I'm standing in front of God, then I won't feel that I've given in to the evil. I'll feel that I've done the work that needs to be done in order to work with what I have. So on the one hand, I don't expect myself to constantly be perfect. On the other hand, when I do negative things, when the evil rises up inside of me, negative, call it the evil, negative, whatever you want to call it, then I don't feel that it's the end of the world and therefore succumb to it and bring a sacrifice in the field. Instead, I can consciously, conscientiously think about what is realistic in the sense of what am I able to do in order to be left alone by the evil, give it its part, and accept the fact that it also has a part in my life. What is this called? This is called suppression. So we had a whole series on defense mechanisms. So the main defense mechanism in psychology is repression. Repression is an unconscious act. The defense, all the defense mechanisms usually function in the beginning as unconscious mechanisms. They happen by themselves. Repression means that a person does something wrong and they repress it. They don't want to come to terms with the fact that they have negative things inside of them. They can't handle it. So they have to repress it. And says Freud, repression comes back to bite you over the head. You can't repress them. Defense mechanisms that are not made conscious will eventually backlash. They will lead to psychosis. That's at least in his theory. What is that? That's exactly psychosis is the giving up on something. Psychosis means this is just how I am. The difference between psychosis and any kind of mental problem that's not a psychosis is that one is chronic and the other one doesn't have to be. And psychosis is already when it becomes part of your character. It becomes part of who you are. That's like sacrificing to the field. I mentioned this a, a number of times and it causes a lot of a lot of uh, controversy every time I say it, but it's, it's, it's pretty well established that the thing called demons, Ibn Ezra and the, uh, mentions it in the verses discussing sacrificing outside of the temple, and Ahmadides mentions it, everybody mentions it, that the seirim, the, the goats that are dancing outside, they're really what we call demons, shadim, shades. In psychology, the translation is very simple. That when you sacrifice outside, you're sacrificing to the shadows, to these shadim, to these seirim, as they're called. It's basically making it a permanent fixture of yourself. Like we said before, sacrificing yourself to the evil. That's what a psychosis is. 
It's already like admitting that this is who I am. It can't be any different. It's very desperate situation when you come to them. It feels like you can never, you can never free yourself anymore. But you can. I'm just saying that like the way Freud says it, if it's unconscious, it will lead to psychosis. Eventually. It doesn't have to, but more often than not. That's what defense mechanisms turn into if they're not made conscious. That's repression. Repression is to repress the evil inside of me. I'm not repressing other people's evil. I'm repressing mine. But there is another option. And that's the option that the Baal Shem Tov now explained, which is called suppression. And suppression is done consciously. That's what it means to be before God. To be before God is to act conscientiously, to act with consciousness, to be aware of what I'm doing. Being in front of God, facing God constantly, is focusing on what I'm doing and becoming conscious of what I'm doing. That's what it means to stand in front of God. If I would have to translate what it means to, tr to stand in front of God, it would mean that I am conscious, I'm aware of what I am doing. That's suppression. Suppression says, I'm aware of the fact there's negative things inside of me. And I'm aware of the fact that I have to give them a bribe. I accept it. I didn't create myself. This is how God created me. I have no interest in them. I don't want them, but they're part of me for now. So for now, I have to deal with them. But this is me. What do you mean this is me? I suppress them. To give them a bribe is to suppress them, is to say, here's your part, leave me alone. Let me now go do what I want to do. That's suppression. I don't want to think about you. I don't want meaning. <laughs> Imagine that our friend now, he's drunk a very hot, beautiful, delicious cup of coffee. And now we can sit down and learn or dive in or do whatever he wants. So what does he need to think now? Oh, I'm so negative that the only way I could get up is by, by promising myself a cup of coffee. So I wasn't interested in davening. I wasn't interested in praying. I wasn't interested in anything. What, what, what was I interested in? I was interested in my cup of coffee. So what good is the good that I do? Because it's all out of self-interest. Suppression means understanding that the bribe that I gave is exactly that. It's the only way to work with the negative. There's no other way I can do it. I have to find a way to make it possible for me to serve the good. And that means being aware of the fact that there's negative things inside and that they need to be dealt with in some way. That's the bribe, that's the suppression. That's what frees me and allows me then to go and serve the good with a clean conscience because I've done what's needed to do in order to get there. And I didn't do the negative, or, you know, drinking a cup of coffee is not such a negative thing, except that I said, except that it's on Yom Kippur. But in general, the thing that I did even though it was self-interest, it doesn't take away from the value of what I did after that, what it allowed me to do, what it, what it encouraged me to do, what it, what it promoted. I'm just gonna end and, and then I'll take the questions. I'm just gonna end with one final thought. I mentioned that exile is a mix, is when good and evil are mixed together. And the first exile was the exile from the Garden of Eden. But the Baal Shem Tov says something even more powerful. That exile by definition is meant to be the time in which we learn to deal with evil. Okay? That needs to be de developed a lot more. But the time of the exile is the time in which 
there is evil inside and evil outside, and we learn to deal with it as part of God's world. Before God. What does God want with this? Why is this part of it? Why is it that some things can only be attained by these evil things, suffering, and so on and so forth? And one final thought is that there are two he goats. Why? Because Indeed, one of them teaches us how to realistically deal with evil. The other one goes to become a sin offering inside the Holy of Holies, and it atones perfectly for all the sins. That a person has to know that there is the option open of becoming completely cleansed of evil. That does exist. It doesn't, you can't live your whole life saying, I'm forever doomed to dealing with what I'm dealing with. No, there always has to be the hope that there's the other goat, and that goat is a sacrifice that goes to atone completely, and when it's finished, it's finished. There's nothing left of the evil. It's a different story altogether. And both stories have to be in the consciousness of every person at all times. Meaning, I'm now overcoming evil because I feel it and I'll do everything I need to do in order to overcome it the way we just learned by suppression. And the other hand, I don't expect there to be another time. There will not be another test. I don't have to think that way. I have to believe that once I'm finished with this test, that's it. Exile is over. Those two feelings have, those two goats have to be identical meaning they have to be the same size, the same, meaning I have to be willing to exercise both options equally, completely equally. That here I am dealing with the evil and I know now how to do it correctly by not ignoring it, by not saying I'm stronger than it and not, not uh, um, um, uh, thinking that somehow it's not here. And on the other hand, I have to believe that this is the final and last time that I'm going to have to deal with it. And that the other goat is going to serve its purpose and there will be full atonement in the world. And again, it's a goat. It represents the same evil is going to be completely slaughtered and finished. 